Yeah, it got a bit of a glow up. This one's kind of fun. The folks at Infinix sent this over. This is the Note 40 Pro Plus 5G, the next iteration of the Note lineup, and things have changed quite a bit in terms of design and aesthetic. Infinix has been making some killer options, more affordable options, but packed full of bells and whistles. This is last year's Note 30 Pro, and you can see it's got really flat, kind of fake chromed sides, still has a headphone jack on the bottom of the phone, and we had some really playful color options like like this iridescent sort of uh, hyperwave colored back. For the Note 40 Pro, I think we're going after a very specific kind of design language that we saw a couple years ago. Hmm, sort of a faux green leather, a nice large camera assembly cutout, curves and tapers, really skinny rail feel here in the fingertips. Where have we seen this before? I don't know. I'm trying to think, you know, off the top of my head, if I can recall any phones that have done sort of faux green leather with the sort of goldish or copper accent. I'm kind of drawing a blank here. So if there's anything that you remember, folks, uh, if you could drop a comment down uh, underneath this video, like what other kinds of manufacturers have dabbled with this design language, it would really help me out because I'm just drawing a total blank. Yep. I can't think of a single one. Okay, yeah, I'm being kind of cheeky, but I do think it's interesting when a company like Infinix, they change up their design language. Something that feels a little fresh, that there's a little bit more novelty. The core mission of the Note series still remains. We're gonna pack a phone full of bells and whistles. We're gonna, we're gonna make some targeted compromises to the experience to make sure that we're coming in at an acceptable price point. Again, I can't account for all regions and all areas and the exchange rate of currency, but very generally speaking, this phone is attempting somewhere under $300 US. There's at least something interesting to talk about. So we've already detailed a lot of what I think is kind of interesting about the design. Top of the phone, we still have that IR blaster and that JBL speaker logo here on the top. Bottom of the phone, we got that USB-C. I'm gonna pull out the SIM card. It's a dual SIM, so that's pretty nifty there. No micro SD card, but I am reviewing the 256 gigabyte version of this phone. I know they put things on here like 24 gigabits of RAM, but what we're really doing is 12 plus 12. So there's 12 gigabytes of actual RAM, which is actually pretty good for a phone in this segment, and then 12 gigabytes of a swap space that uses your storage just as sort of a temporary holdover. I'm not the kind of guy who likes to discuss that feel in the hand. Most of these products are well designed for evolved primates with opposable thumbs. But the one thing I will point out is for a lot of these devices that come to this more aesthetic taper and have this really skinny rail feel in your fingers, it makes me a little less confident holding and using the phone as a camera. I like the flatter sides because they're a bit more practical to kind of kind of keep your fingers gripping the phone. And flipping the phone over, we've got a bottom mounted fingerprint sensor. It's a little low for my tastes, but it's decently responsive. And we've got this nice 1080p OLED up to 120 Hertz. We do have a fair number of controls for this screen. Uh, for example, a high brightness mode. Infinix is rating this at up to 2400 nits. It is a nice punchy bright OLED, but don't expect it to be outperforming significantly more expensive phones. But every little bit helps when you get slightly better outdoor readability. We also have some nice color profiles in here too, where you can kind of switch up the uh, the look and feel of your display. You want to boost up the brightness or if you want to change the color tone, something a little cooler or something a little warmer. Infinix has been doing a really good job of adding some of these lifestyle and quality of life features to a lot of their phones, even though these phones are coming in at lower price points. I wish the haptics were a little bit more powerful, but I like that we're getting away on these phones. Again, we're getting away from those fizz, 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 fizz kinds of haptic motors. And instead, we've got something that's got a nice, distinct little pulse and pop to it. I prefer something that's just a little bit more distinct and a little bit more responsive to on-screen actions, as opposed to something that's, you know, rattling my hip whenever I need it to get my attention. And for that JBL logo on the top of the phone, we would expect some pretty decent speakers on this thing. I want us to keep in mind the price of the phone. And so a lot of the, uh, the points that we make here with something like an Infinix is for the price, the performance is fill in the blank. So let's take a quick listen to some jazz. I don't 
don't think we were expecting this phone to win any speaker awards of the year. It's a little hollow sounding. I wish the speakers could get a bit louder, but even at max volume, we're at that point where we're starting to hear that those little bits of distortion. I'd say we're in pretty good mid-pack shape, even though this is not a mid-pack priced phone. The thing that is kind of a bummer is this note Pro Plus doesn't have a headphone jack on it. Now, Infinix uh, sent this over very well accessorized, literally in the box that Infinix sends the phone in. We had the case and the charger. And because we don't have that headphone jack, they do include these like sort of uh, ear pod style earbuds. There's a little USB-C plug in right there so you can connect them directly to the USB-C port on your phone. It's a nice admission that they're removing something from the phone itself. I just, I just wish we still had these kinds of options where a pair of cabled headphones can go you a long way. And now even on our less expensive phones, there's the expectation that we'll be stepping up to significantly more expensive Bluetooth earbuds. Getting into the performance, and this is a nice little uptick over the Note 30 Pro that I reviewed before. I always gotta laugh when we're showing off these Geekbench scores and like, oh, we've got two clusters of CPU cores and one's at two gigahertz and one's at 2.2 gigahertz. And, and these numbers right here, they tell you literally nothing. The improvement in this new MediaTek chip over the previous year's phone is that we've stepped up the two bigger cores are more powerful, bigger cores. We've gone from A76 cores to A78 cores. And this has had you know, a nice little nudge. It's not a radical difference. It's not a night and day difference, but it's a nice little just bump into our CPU scores. Unsurprisingly, our single core scores now are closing in on performance from back in the Snapdragon 865 days. And very anecdotally in the hand compared against the Note 30 Pro, this phone is a little snappier. It's a little more performant and it can get a slightly higher tier of work done. But on this new MediaTek, we're dealing with a different GPU. And unfortunately, this is a GPU that is currently borking on a lot of Geekbench's uh, measurements. This Vulcan score, we're talking about synthetic benchmark number scores here. Not only does this not really tell you much of anything, it's also just telling you the phone wasn't able to properly complete the, the Geekbench test suite. Oh, checking out a slightly older game, but one that still kind of has some uh, beefy graphics to it. We would still hope to see around 60 frame per second frame rates here in a game like Implosion. It's got like sort of last gen graphics, but something that's still meatier than a, a lot of your just sort of a gotcha, uh, you know, microtransaction, casual gaming. The Infinix here is doing a really good job of keeping up with this. So even though we're, we're definitely having some issues with, uh, oh, gotta dodge, gotta dodge. When there's lots of force feedback coming from this, uh, Oh, gotta move, gotta move. There's a lot of uh, <laughs> vibration control coming. Ah, I missed that cue. I'm, I used to be really good at this game. It's been a while since I played it. But uh, there's there's lots of that vibration motor haptic uh, response. Let me see if I can kill this guy. But I'm not dropping frames. This isn't slowing down. And I think we're in for a treat. Again, for such an inexpensive phone, there's a lot of potential here. So even though that Geekbench score couldn't properly uh, complete, it's not that we're, uh, we're lacking some GPU compute. Another quick look at a precision platformer. We've got dead cells here. And again, this is playing a lot better. Oof. I'm out of out of uh, out of practice playing this on a touch screen. Uh, this is looking a lot better again than what we would expect from a uh, a budget tier phone. Something that uh, you know is is using sort of a lower power MediaTek chipset. I, I, ultimately, when we start extrapolating this kind of performance from a game like because you can't have dropped frames, stutters, or skips in dead cells. You need to be able to time and jump. And, and playing on a touch screen is kind of the hardest way to play dead cells. So when we extrapolate this kind of performance against, uh, you know, maybe a more graphically in, a graphics intense game, I would have high expectations that playing those games, as long as you can tweak some of the, uh, some of the quality settings that should be perfectly capable and that this is doing a lot better than I was expecting it would. In testing the phone, the radio performance has been really solid, but one of the things that has been annoying is how aggressive the phone can be in interrupting background tasks. For example, I'm trying to download something from my NAS, and in leaving this to then go look at like some gaming performance, the game, even though I've got 12 gigs of RAM, 
it interrupted the background download here, which really shouldn't have been taking up a lot of space and memory. It's those kinds of things like, you know, it helps manage the performance of the phone so the phone feels snappier in the moment when you're using that one app, but even with the extra RAM and this backup 12 plus 12 swap space that's going on here, it, I still find that it's a little more difficult to keep these kinds of uh, these kinds of apps running in the background. And a quick tour around the software, we've got that 120 hertz display. And like I said, the, the slight differences in CPU design here really do add up to a smooth, sleek feeling experience. Um, Infinix has significantly cleaned up their UI. This is a very heavy and aggressive skin, but we've got like fun features for different types of folders. The layout is just buttery smooth. Everything is kind of flowing the way that you would expect it to. You're not sort of lagging or, or waiting for the phone to catch up to your commands. And we're adding those other lifestyle elements like so many phone manufacturers are coming out with these little side docks that you can get into additional functionality. Quick, easy access to commonly used apps and screenshots and screen recordings. I mean, stuff that, that I think people are, are doing more and more and more. The thing that still bugs me is when we have this split notification shade. I really don't like how specific the gesture needs to be when you're reaching, because also I like being able to tell the uh, the skin, so the launcher here, uh, when you do a swipe down from the middle, it usually brings up a search. But now I've told it to pull down my notifications, but that's not my quick actions and toggles. I would really like to be able to just pull and then have my most commonly used quick actions here at the top. That is the Android way to do things. If I wanted an iPhone, I would go and buy an iPhone. I just think it's kind of annoying that there's an expectation that on a tall, skinny phone, someone is going to be super precise about what side of the screen they're going to pull this gesture from. And if you're off that edge by just a little bit, what happens is it just pulls the notification. So if I wanted my quick actions and toggles, but I didn't quite reach the upper edge with my little stumpy thumb, well, uh, oh, I guess now I've got to do that. And it's an additional gesture to swipe that over. I have to use extra gestures when I'm really out and about to try and get to those different features and settings. But even though it's inexpensive, there are a lot of really fun additional settings that people should check out. This is not a stripped, bare bones, inexpensive kind of device. There are a lot of things in here to check out from cloning apps, having a dedicated kids mode, some of the gaming improvements that you can bring up, multitasking and floating windows. All of this is brought into the settings in a very clear and distinct fashion, which I really dig. Even getting down into like additional lighting effects for the back of the phone. See, look at this, that's just kind of cute. I've got this little like uh, colorful light system letting me know that I've got a notification that I should probably check out. This is just something a little fun. It's a little fresh and I, I think it's a unique take. This should bring us over into talking about the cameras, but really there's only one camera here worth using. The main shooter on the back of the phone is the Samsung HM6, a 108 megapixel cam- No, 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 it's fine. It's a 12 megapixel shooter. It's a one over 1 1.6 inch type sensor. Again, this is punching above the price tag for still photos. As long as we're going bigger than a half inch, then I think we're in really good shape for stills. Definitely notice some little improvements when we're talking about night mode photography. It's tricky because even though we have stabilization, it has a little OIS here on the uh, the side kind of stamped into the, uh, the camera module. It's still pretty shaky. There's not a lot of stabilization built into this system, but it is impressive to see that if I take a, a dark shot here in my office and then I switch over to Super Night, that is a much more usable photo. I'm very impressed with what this thing can do for stills. And we do have a mode that takes us into that demosaic 108 megapixel full resolution capture you're probably not going to use that very often. I don't really think it's that helpful, but you can do it on this phone. The Achilles heel, of course, is going to be video where uh, we don't have 4K capture. We do have 2560 by 1440. We can do a quad HD video resolution. It's a functional video shooter, 
but it's a surprisingly good stills camera. It just goes without saying at this point that the extra macro sensor on these phones is practically useless. You can get a much better close-up shot if you crop from the main camera sensor. I gotta kill the lights real quick to talk about this other camera feature. Really excited to see this one. Okay, you can see the phone is already trying to tell me it's way too dark in here, right? It's way too dark. What we can do is go over to Super Night that does that longer exposure. I actually, you know, I showed Super Night. I, I think it's actually a pretty solid option for this kind of phone. But now we've got these new flash features. Now the flashes work kind of the same way as any other phone. You can sort of always throw the flash. You can let the phone decide when to float, throw the flash. And then we have this light bulb mode. And light bulb mode is really cool. So I'm gonna turn this on and it's just sustained illumination with a little bar here giving us options because on the back, we've got a four LED ring flash. There's a lot more light coming off the back of this phone. I'm just gonna go ahead and bump this up to maximum. This is a feature we just recently saw on the V-series Vivos, the V27, V29, V30. Those V-series Vivos, significantly more expensive phones than what Infinix is selling right here. So it's nighttime, it's dark, you've got a couple different options now for how you might wanna boost a shot. But with your, if you're with a bunch of friends and you wanna get that really nice illuminated look, you can boost that photo a lot more if you need the light. And that's gonna bring us to the battery life and the power management. One of the major upgrades is the charge speed. Now, this is actually a slightly smaller battery. We're talking somewhere around a 4,600 milliamp hour battery cell, but you can see like all over the box and all over the packaging, we now have 100 watt fast charging. This thing charges really crazy fast. Slightly smaller battery capacity, big old power brick, 100 watt charging. This to me is fundamentally one of the most exciting upgrades that we're seeing fall to lower and lower price points real actual fast charging is more useful than wireless charging, which this phone also has up to 20 watt wireless charging and it does support reverse wireless charging. This doesn't have the biggest battery, so I don't know how much you wanna go sort of, you know, topping off your friend's phones when you're out and about. Maybe you're a nicer person than I am. But when you know you can plug in for like 10 minutes and get almost a whole day of runtime, it takes a lot of that battery anxiety off your plate. That the fast charger is also included in the box is just a nice perk. I mentioned that this also came with a case. And if you notice, we've got these like circles here. I don't know if people are familiar with the circles on these kinds of cases. But it's a nice little clip-on unit. It reminds me a lot of the nicer snap-on shells that we used to get with Vivos. It's not gonna do anything for side drop damage. You know, your sides are totally exposed here. But it kind of keeps the profile of the phone similar, gives you a little protection just for the faux leather on the back. There's just a little bit of an edge. Uh, it's not gonna protect a whole lot in a corner drop, but if the phone happens to end up screen down, you're probably not gonna scrape it up. Also included in the box is a screen protector that you can apply, it's not pre-applied. So it gives you a little extra peace of mind just in buying the phone, it is fully accessorized. On top of that, I showed off this shell for the box because what also came with my Note 40 Pro Plus was this extra little puck. So when you connect this extra little puck to your charger, it's got a little USB-C right there. It happens to line up almost perfectly with these circles right here for a little magnet action that can support the weight of the phone. My fingers are actually pushing against the phone right now to try and pop it off. A much better solution for wireless charging. They're calling it the MagPad, the wireless magnetic charger. Helps keep the coils aligned with the phone so the charging is a little bit more efficient. But I just think it's funny where if you've got this connected to this and you're plugging this in, sure, there's the convenience of not actually plugging it into the phone, but it's gonna charge at one fifth the total speed when you could just unplug it from here and plug it in there and then it's gonna charge so much faster. And plus, I just gotta show this off. So Infinix uh, sells this, this is the MagPad, and I think you can also buy this as a separate accessory, but when you get the, uh, the instructions for the MagPad, I'm gonna zoom in on this so that you all can see what I think is funny. You know, they say, oh, you can plug it in here and then you plug it into an adapter and that's how you power your MagPad. It doesn't come with a power brick. You've got to supply your own. But then the phone that they use to demonstrate the MagPad does not look like any Infinix that I've seen before. The MagPad is being used with, drop a comment down below this video. What what phone do you think they were they were using for their illustration here, for their guide? of the MagPad. Because if I kind of hold these side by side, I, 
I don't think these look very similar. I think I think one looks different than the other. Could be me though. Maybe I'm way off base, but you you leave your thoughts in the comments below. And this is where we're going to go ahead and start wrapping this video up. Getting to spend a little time with an Infinix is always a treat. I like getting to see what competition looks like in other regions and other markets and at a variety of different price points. The Note series has kind of become one of those that I look forward to every year. Especially this year, we're showing off a different style, a different aesthetic a different combination of features, and they're taking some risks on some fun lifestyle perks. It's not the snappiest phone of the year. It's not going to win any performance awards. And, you know, around $300, it's really not difficult to find a phone that might outperform it. But often then we're making other compromises for those companion features and those lifestyle features. So when we're talking about the pocket computer as a daily communicator companion device, we've got a really good recipe here. We've got a really good option to offer folks. Kind of drives me crazy that I can't show these things off more to my family and friends here in North America. I think this would do really well at one of our low cost carriers here in the United States, but unfortunately that would come with a whole bunch of other issues and certifications and pricing and all that other nonsense you have to the hoops you have to jump through when you do business in the United States. Just gonna pry this off while we wrap this video up. I will, of course, leave some links down below, more information on Infinix phones where you can uh, check out the new Note 40 Pro Plus. As always, folks, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been amazing. Those of you clicking on links in my video descriptions or hitting my home site, somegadgetguide.com, or maybe you've joined the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguide. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the omniverse. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, at some gadget guy, basically everywhere. But these days I'm spending a bit more time on the Mastodons, a little less so on the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and definitely not on the Twitters. And I will catch you all on the next video.